When I was a freshman at the University of Alabama in 1987, the student body there elected an African-American homecoming queen. I'm still not exactly sure how it happened because at the University of Alabama, African-American girls are not supposed to be the homecoming queen. There's actually a system in place to prevent such a thing. It's called the machine. And the machine is a secret society, much like Skull and Crossbones at, at Yale, but the machine's purpose is to make sure that African Americans don't get into elected positions at the University of Alabama. And it's an organization run by the Greek system. So the fraternities and the sororities each pick one member, and that's their secret participant in the machine. And then they decide together who's going to be student body president and also homecoming queen. And then they come back and tell all the rest of you how that's going to work. And the reason this it went this way, that African Americans are not supposed to be in these positions, is because the Greek system was at that time in 1987 at the University of Alabama still a segregated system. African Americans were not allowed into the white fraternity and sorority houses. Because I often find this interesting, you can just shout it out. I will tell you it is an integrated system now. But do you have any guesses as to when the University of Alabama integrated its Greek system? Anybody? What year? 95, 2000, 2003. You're the closest. 2013. Three and a half years ago, the University of Alabama's Greek system became integrated. But the year I was there, in 1987, it was still a segregated system. And this, the rest of the student body, who were not Greeks, had had just about enough of that. And they banded together, and they elected an African-American homecoming queen. Her name was Opal Butler. And she was crowned at Bryant-Denny Stadium in front of an audience of 60,000 people there in person. She was also watched by an audience of over a million people in a nationally televised game. And I had, had chosen the University of Alabama because I wanted somewhere different from what I'd grown up with. I was born in Philadelphia. I wanted to travel somewhere where I could be in a new culture. And the South seemed like a good place to me. And, um, so, and I'll tell you what, it turned out to be a pretty different culture. I was standing there in that stadium in the Greek section, in the student, in the student body section that, that housed all the Greeks at the at the stadium that day, and they called Opal Butler's name, and I stood up with everybody else to cheer for her, only I stood up to cheer, and everyone around me stood up, and they turned their backs on that young girl, and they started to boo. And y'all, I still remember the feeling as I stood there in this crowd of people booing at this young woman on that field. And I certainly realized I was in a different culture at that moment. And, but here's the thing. I, I could not boo that girl. I couldn't turn my back on her. And yet, everybody else had. And, and I think I was so shocked. I was so caught off guard by what they were doing. And, and I knew that I couldn't do what they were doing. And yet, at the same time, I couldn't leave. And it sounds kind of horrible, I'm sure. But the thing is, they were, they were my friends, right? They, these were the people I, I lived with. And, and they were actually pretty good people in many other ways. They loved their parents and they, you know, raised money for charities. And yet they were doing this horrible, ugly thing. And, and I, I couldn't move. It was like I was paralyzed with this shock of being there. And pretty quickly it, it ended, everybody sat down, and, and, and she moved off the field. And, and yet, I will never forget sitting there in that stadium that day, realizing that, like, I'd just become somebody I didn't like. I'd done something horrible. I'd stood with the crowd when I knew it was the wrong thing to do. And if there's any silver lining to the story, it's that at 18 years old, I knew exactly who I didn't want to be anymore. And I made a vow to myself that night that I was never again going to be a person who stood silently while someone was hurt. There's a Desmond Tutu quote, and it says, He who stands silent in the face of injustice has chosen the side of the oppressor. 
And you know, there are plenty of people who've said to me in hearing that story, but, but you didn't do that. You didn't boo her. You didn't turn your back on the girl. And I am here to tell you that standing silently with people who are doing that is the exact same thing. It can be worse, absolutely. Now, it didn't take too long for me to have a chance to have to make good on that vow. And I knew that it was going to come at me one of these days, right? That I was going to be in a position again. But I also knew that part of my mistake that first time is that I'd been shocked. I didn't know what to do because I was so caught off guard. And I practiced in my little 18-year-old head all the ways in which I might be called upon to stand up for somebody so that I'd be ready when it happened. And five years later, there was this ferocious knocking on my door, like a frantic beating on the door. And at that time, I was living in Guatemala. It was the end of the Civil War. The Civil War there had went on for just over a quarter century. 26 years of Civil War were taking place there. And it was the government using the army, their military, to fight against the rebel soldiers in the highlands. So they were, there was a genocide going on. They were killing off the native tribes and the native people and taking over their lands. And so this guerrilla war was happening in the mountains. And I lived in a little town in the highlands in Guatemala at that time, a little, it's a, it's a kind of a, a rinky-dink little town, as, as most of them are in Guatemala. I had a little one-room mud hut, and there's this knocking on the door, and I open it, and it's my friend Josefina standing there. And she has this terrified look on her face, and she's got a son under each arm, and she said to me, they're coming. Elena, they're coming. They're coming for the kids. And I could hear her behind us, this low rumbling. And what it was is it was trucks, and it was tanks, and it was the army coming into town. And they'd adopted this policy at the end of the war because they were so low on manpower that they would send troops into the mountain villages, and they would break through the door of every home, and they would search them, and they were kidnapping all of the boys from about age 12 and up, and they were conscripting them into military service. And if the young boys would not fight against their fathers and their uncles and their brothers, they would either kill them or they would kill their mothers or their sisters, which is worse. And that is how they got these young boys to serve in the military. And I could hear the tanks coming. And Josefina looked at me and she said, take my children, hide my children. And the thing is, I was a Peace Corps volunteer at the time and they had taught us that you know, they taught us about the government and the war and what was going on, and they said very specifically, you cannot be involved. You cannot involve yourself in any way. If something happens, if you are taken, if you are jailed, we cannot help you. And if you're jailed, you'll be lucky because you'll probably be killed. And yet there is Josefina, my friend, and they're coming for her children. And she was a widow. Her husband had already been killed in the war. She had four daughters and two sons and they were going to be taken. And I took her boys, and she ran off, and I brought them into my home. And as I said, it was really only just a one-room mud hut. I had a bed, and I had a table, and I had a basket where I kept some food. But off on the other side of the house, there was actually one more room, and it had a big padlock on it. And when I had rented the house, the landlord had told me, you can never go into this room. But I've never been very good at following instructions. And so I found the key, and I had looked into this room, and what was in this room was a whole bunch of statuary from the Catholic Church. There had been an earthquake some years back, and so they had taken all of the artifacts from the church and stuffed them into this room to, to, as a storehouse. And there was a big altar, and then there was, you know, all the, the Catholic statues. There was Mary holding Christ, and there was Michael, the archangel. And... I quickly grabbed the key and I unlocked the room and I put the boys in the back of this altar. And I knew we only had minutes and I said, just be quiet. No matter what happens, be quiet. I'll keep you safe. And I had just finished locking the door, the padlock on that storeroom when my door was kicked open and the military men came into the house and they, you know, two seconds, had seen everything there was to see, and the man in charge said, open that door. Well, I had the key in my hand. I hadn't even had time to hide it again. And I said, I can't open the door. 
and he put a gun to me and he said, open that door. And I went to the basket as if the key was hidden there all the time saying, I can't, I, I can't open the door. And the thing is, I knew that our only hope was if I could somehow get the men not to go into that room, right? There was, they were going to see the boys the minute they went in. And there wasn't much that was going to keep the men from going in the room, except Guatemalans by nature are a slightly suspicious group of people. They're a little superstitious in that the Catholic faith combined with the indigenous shamanistic belief system has created sort of this merger of myth and stories, uh, and they believe in a spirituality that's all around you at any time. And I figured my only hope was to kind of to take advantage of that. And I said to the man as I reached out the key, I said, I can't open the door. I said, I have heard that that room is cursed. I said, and in fact, the last person who opened that door was a pregnant woman, and that very night, she gave birth to her child and died in childbirth, and the child died with her. I said, and I've heard that the man who opened that door before her, he choked on a chicken bone that very same night. I said, so I can't do it. I can't open the door. I said, but if you're braver than I am, here's the key. You open the door. I said, but tell me if it's true, if you see the face of Satan coming for you when you open the door. But what he hadn't known was that in addition to Mary holding Christ and in addition to Michael the archangel, in the room was a statue of Lucifer, right? And I, as I closed the door, I pulled that statue over and I grabbed the bottom of it and I tugged the base of that statue just into the path of the door as I closed it. And I'll tell you what, y'all, nothing in my life has ever gone exactly the way I needed it to go except that one day, because as those men kicked that door open, it caught the edge of the statue and as the door opened, this enormous Satan came flying out of the open doorway at the army commander. And I'll tell you what, never have you seen a group of armed men run screaming from a room the way they did that day at my house. And so the boys were safe, and God bless them, they stayed quiet when that Satan took off. And they were safe, and I'm safe, and obviously I'm here telling you the story. But you know, I've thought back to those two things um, a lot over the past many years. Um, and I, you know, in, in part, I guess I feel like in some ways, had I not been a party to humiliating and hurting Opal Butler that day, I also would not have been a party to saving those children. The one directly led to the other. The mistake that I made directly led to doing the right thing another time. And as I think about the ways in which in our country over the past year, we have done things like stand and turn our backs on people. We have booed. We have heard knocks at the door and refused to answer them. I've thought back to Opal a lot. And, you know, I've, I've been thinking of a, a person in that story I hadn't really given much consideration to. I, I've been thinking about Opal's mother and what that must have been like for her that day to see her child accomplish something really beautiful and watch so many people choose to hurt her in the process. And I think, you know, I imagine her mother standing there cheering for her in the hope that her voice might drown out all the rest of them. And I think, what if I had chosen instead to behave like Opal Butler's mother that day? Right? What if I could have found the courage to rush down the stairs at that stadium and cheer for that girl with everything I had? I wish I could have done that. And it makes me think, too, about Lucinda, my friend, and why she came to me that day, another mother. And, you know, I've, I've thought often that perhaps she came to me because I'm American, right? That my white skin, she thought, might somehow prevent the, the soldiers from coming into my house. And I think that's part of it. But I think a larger piece of that is that she came to me because she relied on my love for her and her children. Right? She was my friend. And at the moment in her life when she could not be the mother her children needed, when she could not hide them, she lived in a lean-to abutting a pigsty. She had nothing. When she couldn't shelter them, she came to me. And what she did that day when she said, will you take my children, is that she said, will you be a mother to my children? Will you do for them what I can't? 
And over this past year, as we've turned our back and as we've booed and we've refused to answer the door, I've thought about those two women. And I have thought, what if we were able to act like mothers to each other? What if we could find in our hearts the compassion and the joy of saying, yes, I will shelter you. Knock at my door and I will let you in. I will protect you. I will treat you like you're one of my own. And what I posit today, what I challenge you all with is this. I think that if we are willing to mother each other, that that is the way. It may be the only way that we will make America great. Thank you all.